and we're going to go ahead and get started with what we have. Sarah and Kristen, thanks for your time today, and uh, we can go ahead and get started anytime. Hi, everyone. So it sounds like you can't um, type in the chat, or some of you can't. I really prefer um, to do an ongoing conversation. So please just unmute yourself or raise your hand, and we will definitely answer your questions. Clearly, um, there's been some technical issues this morning. I am Sarah Rennie. I'm the executive director of the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. I've been an attorney for 22 years, and I also ran um, a homeless shelter that also had a physical domestic violence shelter who was where we were also the HARA. So I have some deep experience in the complexities of um, serving uh, folks who are homeless, folks who are homeless with domestic and sexual violence and folks with domestic violence. With me today is Kristen Meisner, who I am pleased to be with and I'm gonna let her um, introduce herself, Kristen. Hi everyone, I'm Kristen Meisner, Program Development Director for the Human Development Commission. We are a large community action agency located in the Thumb, covering here on Lapeer, Sanilac, and Tuscola counties. Um, I have about 20 years of housing experience myself, and currently at Human Development Commission, um, I operate a victim service program, which includes services for domestic and sexual violence survivors, and I also oversee HARA functions um, for the service area. So um, again, if you have any questions, uh, um, please feel free to raise your hand or um, unmute yourself and we'll do our best to try to answer them. Thank you. And thank you to Micah for hosting us, the Michigan Coalition Against Homelessness. And um, if we could advance the slide. So when I start these trainings, oh, when I start these trainings, um, I definitely want to start with um, the uh, idea of how big we are. Um, just a reminder that we're 83 counties, um, that there are, we're home to 12 federally recognized times. We have snowfall, and I see my friend Mary Nemo is on here. Um, it's in our northern rural counties exceeds 220 inches on average, and it's often um, several feet deep. I always start with this slide to ground us in how different our communities are. Um, so that we can share respectfully our experiences and understand that they do vary given how widely uh, diverse a state we are. Next slide. The other thing we wanna cover is this, we'll be talking about domestic violence as well as sexual violence. And we wanna make sure um, that folks know that domestic violence is more than just physical violence. Um, it is a pattern of power and control where folks use economic abuse, coercion, intimidation, emotional abuse, children to control the other person. Kristen, did you have anything you wanted to add on this slide? Nope, go ahead, Sarah. Okay, um, most of you, this is just a brief review, but I want folks to remember that a perpetrator of violence will often attempt to control their victims every part of their lives. And that includes um, and very specifically destabilizing their work um, life as well as their housing life because they are trying to force um, the person to return to them. I did want to um, add, I use gendered statements. There's no, that does not mean men cannot be victims. And we certainly also recognize that in LGBTQ victims, there are, um, there are folks who are victims within the LGBT community. This is me um, with 22 years of my lived experience. You may hear Kristen using other, gen other types of gendered language. It's irrelevant to the conversation. What we're talking about was who's the vic that victims are abused in multitudes of different ways. We also want to um, really remind folks that um, people come to us with different lived identities and those identities experience our systems differently. So um, folks who have a marginalized racial identity orientation, might be seniors, may experience our systems differently than someone who doesn't. And one of the things I really wanna emphasize is research has shown on all of our systems, whether it's DV or homelessness, the more marginalizations you have, 
the less able our systems are able to meet the person where they're at and meet their needs. So think through that when you're thinking about domestic violence, when someone's already using the ways our society, um, others folks to um, abuse them, how we might be contributing to that and buying into various stereotypes. So I'm gonna slow down because I am told that I talk too fast um, and engage and make sure Kristen has an opportunity to speak. So you'll hear me um, hesitating now that we've gone through the preparatory slides to see if you wanna unmute and ask questions. So this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Please, if you haven't gone and liked our Facebook page, do we're the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. We re represent, just like Micah does, all of the domestic violence service providers in Michigan while Micah does homelessness. Um, we he are here to provide training, technical support, and advocacy on behalf of domestic violence programs. What, and in Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we wanted to talk to you also about the Violence Against Women Act. The Violence Against Women Act was groundbreaking in 1994. And I want you to think about um, how close in time that was. I graduated from high school in 1991. When I began as an advocate, uh, we still couldn't get law enforcement to do anything more than walk folks around the corner. There was no funding it, in a formal way for domestic violence and sexual assault programs. So please know that this work has been um, due to a bunch of passionate uh, folks and is really fairly new in the grand scheme of things. So one of the things we really want you to know is there's VAWA has not stayed the same since 1994. Additional protections and funding has been added um, in every sort of version. The most, the one we're gonna talk today is the 2013 reauthorization because we really expanded our housing protection then. And it, please, we talk about domestic violence because it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month but the violent protections are for domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking, which we're going to refer to as the VAWA crimes. Kristen? Um, just want to jump in real quick, Sarah, and just remind folks that the fundamental purpose of VAWA is really to prevent um, violent crime and respond to the needs of crime victims. So I know some of you work in um, homelessness and you may be familiar with coordinated entry and whether or not um, a domestic violence survivor qualifies for coordinated entry as a category four. That really came out of the HEARTH Act. VAWA protections are something different. And one of the reasons I'm deeply grateful um, for Kristen is that she also, she's currently boots on the ground serving as the HARA, um, her agency is, as well as the domestic violence um, program. So she has able to give you those sort of cross comparison analysis. And so, yes, this is, this is very different. And in fact, one of the challenges um, that we're all trying to solve statewide is how we stop, uh, how we include domestic violence families who are homeless in, um, in various uh, scoring so that it really evaluates the vulnerability and ensures that that particular population is counted in a way that portrays the need that is out there. And part of that are these conversations between DV programs or um, folks in domestic violence work in your programs, because many of you haven't really maybe engaged in the same ways with your housing folks. Um, uh, with your housing folks in the same way that we're hoping that you will begin to. So I want to has it stop there for just a second. Is there anyone who'd like to unmute and ask a question? Since I'm here seeing that the chat is still disabled. And I'd ask Amy to see if she can figure out why we're disabled, because that really is unfortunate. Yeah, I'm going through and allowing folks to talk. I, I apologize. The settings set up on this are really locked down and they're normally not. So I'm we're just going through and as quickly as we can, giving everybody the chance to ask. So about a third of the class, we've 
allowed them to talk. If there are folks who wanna speak up who have that ability, your microphone should be visible. And if you're not that third, please just raise your hand and we will unmute you. And you can go in the questions. I can read those out loud um, as a workaround while we're opening up this access as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's never, it's always, you know, it's always a Monday, right? Um, so it sounds like right now we can go forward, but please feel free if anyone has any questions to raise your hand or just unmute and interrupt me because I can't currently see you. For re that suddenly went away. So <laughs> um, we do have the question feature that is fully functional. And I think part of this is locked down because of the size of the group, some functionality shut off. So everyone is, should be able to ask uh, questions in the Q&A, and then we'll make sure that you can see those. But I'm also in the process of um, opening up the microphone. So we'll keep at it as you go. Thank you for your flexibility. We very much appreciate that. Um, and I don't know why, but I've lost the ability to see Kristen. So Kristen, I'm working on that. There we go. All right. So um, VAWA 2013 expanded protections to more ho housing programs like those within the COC, within ESG, within HOPWA, and HOME. To understand those expansions, um, Kristen, would you like where you, um, it essentially ensured that these protections are more comprehensive um, to fun variously funded programs. But I'm gonna ask uh, Kristen when I'm done to sort of weigh in in case I miss any. It also expanded VAWA crimes to include sexual assault. And I want you to think about that because sexual assault, um, and this is a shout out, if any of you are in Detroit, we want you to call us, call me, um, because we have legal assistance for folks with sexual assault in the housing. Um, and one of the reasons we did that is you will see a lot of landlords, not a lot, but there is a significant number of sexual harassment and sexual assault at, um, matters that go on in housing because of a power differential and because of poverty. It was really important that we include these protections because it's not just a stranger and the partner sexual assault. You often see um, sometimes the landlord being the perpetrator. So please, if you have anything like that, please feel free uh, and I will make sure you all have my email to shoot me an email and I can support you on those. But it was really important that we include sexual assault. Um, we also establish new definitions, such as we, we're going to protect not just the individuals, but people in the household, like spouses, parents, siblings, children, and anyone residing in the household. That's really important um, because sometimes we also need to make sure that uh, children are part of those protected um, folks. And we revised some terminology, and I'm going to ask Kristen to go into this um, about what bifurcation is. But this is a key value. If you could go back, Amy. Um, Sorry. That's okay. This is a key value and um, importance of VAWA 213 is the ability to bifurcate the lease. And so I'm going to ask, yeah, I don't know if Kristen could unmute. So thank you, Kristen. <laughs> it's so challenging to use Zoom or any kind of online platform because you never just, never can just ease that transition in. So I apologize for that. So yeah, VAWA 2013 really focused in on housing um, as it pertains to domestic violence survivors and ensuring that there's not discrimination against domestic violence survivors, dating violence survivors, stalking survivors, and um, sexual assault survivors. Um, I have a really good example um, of a situation where a lease needed to be bifurcated um, and bifurcation just basically means it means to be divided or split. So, um, and you can Google this, the National Housing Law Project, if you Google National Housing Law Project and you Google VAWA protections, um, you should be able to get this case study. In issue two of their 2020 newsletter, um, there was a case in Massachusetts between a housing authority and a domestic violence survivor um, who invoked their rights under VAWA. And the reason this person did this is because the court ruled um, that the housing authority could not evict this individual um, due to the offsite criminal activity of her abusive boyfriend. And to give you some context about how this situation evolved, 
um, a victim and her family uh, moved into an apartment under this housing authority and the boyfriend became violent. In one incident, the boyfriend started punching the victim and she escaped to a neighbor's apartment. And if we kind of circle back to the power and control wheel, um, that'll kind of give you some context of how somebody might be intimidated of a physical threat of violence. Um, and so the woman went to her neighbor's apartment. Naturally, the police were called. The um, boyfriend was arrested and taken to jail. Um, and after this was over, the victim had asked the housing authority if she could bifurcate her lease, which may, means take the boyfriend off of it. Um, the police, upon arresting the individual, had given the housing authority a copy of the police report. And because they had a copy of the police report, the victim thought, well, they have a copy, they know what happened, this individual should be able to be taken off the lease. The housing authority responded to her that she needed to go and get a, a personal protection order and then get back to them and they would consider taking um, him off the lease. So fast forward, um, she never went to go get the personal protection order. And it was partly because she wanted to reconcile with the boyfriend and partly because um, she lacked reliable transportation to get to the court to do it. Um, the boyfriend eventually moved out, um, in, but he stayed on the lease for some time thereafter. And then he eventually started selling drugs outside of the apartment. The housing authority found out about the selling of drugs outside of the apartment. And although sell, he wasn't selling them in the apartment, um, making drug deals outside of the apartment was considered a lease violation. So she was evicted from her apartment because of something that her abusive boyfriend did who wasn't even living there. Um, she was evicted from the apartment because of that uh, criminal activity and she invoked vow protections because when the incident originally happened where he punched her the police were called and she asked the housing authority for um, a bifurcation of the lease and they denied her um, she basically, they, they told her that she needed to have a document that she didn't even have to have. And so a survivor can choose what document they want to give a housing authority or a landlord to certify um, that there has been an instance of domestic violence. And so um, basically the court ruled that they were wrong in doing this. And I'll hand it back to you, Sarah. <laughs> so essentially, what the housing authority should have done was remove him from the lease and not held her responsible for his illegal drug um, activities when he moved out. And that's an important, important um, matter because at some point, um, survivors often um, are in um, leaseholds with their perpetrators. And you often see landlords saying things like, she's got poor credit, he, I can't evict him, they're both the problem. All of that is a violation of two hunt, uh, a violation of VAWA 213. Mr. Griffin, did you have something you wanted to add? I think he didn't know he was unmuted. Um, and if, if anyone has any questions about the bifurcation or any other questions, we have this worked out. And again, I want to sincerely apologize to our speakers and our over 200 participants. The chat is disabled due to the size, but the Q&A piece that you all should have access to at the bottom is available. And so we can monitor that and repeat the questions as they come in. We just won't be doing it through the chat. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. So to recap, if you have a survivor who's under the VAWA um, crimes, she has the right to assert if it's the appropriately funded type of housing. So private, this does not apply to private landlords. And that's not something, um, so if there's no uh, federal dollars involved in the housing, this would not apply. But if she's receiving, if there's ESG funding, if the, um, if the, the program is low income tax credit, all of those are required under VAWA 213 
to take seriously the request to bifurcate the lease, which essentially means um, remove the perpetrator from the lease and allow the um, victim to continue the leasehold. And it is not necessary that the victim get a PPO or any other documentation other than some documentation, which often will be a letter from one of our member agencies. And we have sample letters. If you're from one of our um, member agencies, email me and we have sample letters that we often provide for victims seeking this kind of relief. And Kristen, we do have a related question. Um, it is stated when you bifurcate the lease and the remaining leaseholder moves out, how do you send the security deposit back? Would it go back to all original leaseholders or just the remaining leaseholder? I can do that one, Kristen, okay. if you'd like. So it depends. Oh, first of all, you know, you don't do the, um, you don't return the security deposit until 30 days after the exit and termination of the leasehold. And normally, from my understanding, that's the end of the lease term. So while the perpetrator may be entitled to, um, to the security deposit, it would be after the end of the year. And then it depends on how the lease is written. So if you have a specific question on that, it would really depend on how the lease is written. There's something called joint and several liability under the law, and some folks are there as joint tenants, and it really just depends. But it's an excellent question and one I'd happily explore for you if you have a specific quest, uh, specific legal question as you move forward. All right, thank you. And I did summarize your answer a bit in the answer to, uh, questions and answers so folks have that. And then to Simon, yes, yeah, Simon, Simon, excuse me if I mispronounce your name. I do have your email address and I'll make sure you get a copy of the sample letter from the agency. I'll forward that to the speakers. Thank you. Next um, slide. So some other um, things that you may want to know about VAWA 213. It established new requirements for notification of occupancy rights under VAWA using a HUD form, which is a notice of occupancy rights under the Violence Against Women Act, because we know HUD is clever when they name things. Um, it's a joke. Provides that <laughs> it, it provides that applicants and tenants may not be denied assistance or assistance terminated under one of these housing programs on the basis or as a direct result is of the, that the applicant is a tenant, uh, the applicant or tenant has been or is a victim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. And this is really important. And I want you to really think about how broad that is. You cannot deny someone assistance. So it's to, to something related to their victimization. And we're gonna get into this, but victimization is more than just the physical assault. Although we have had many horror stories of various programs trying to deny, can you go back please? Go, trying to deny victims um, or evict victims because the perpetrator kicks in their door and the police have been called too many times. That's right out. But then so is, there is at least an argument to be made, so is denying a victims um, based on a poor rental history because that poor rental history or pay, poor payment history may have been directly related to the economic abuse of her tenancy which is something that I think many folks who implement these programs are just not aware of. And we're gonna cover that a little more, but I want you to really remember how broad these protections are. And documentation, it is not the, it is not the landlord's um, responsibility or a, nor do they have the authority to evaluate the documentation and say, no, this letter isn't sufficient. What we really need is a court order or a criminal or, or, um, or a police report, which is something else that we see pretty much standard statewide. Next slide. Sure, May I interject and just ask a few more questions because sure. I know these aren't easy for you uh, ladies to see. Um, one question was who should a victim contact for help if experiencing issues where bifurcation process uh, may help that, that particular population has a different approach 
to the education of their children because their applications go and to pass Michelle, a test. I don't think, I don't think you. Michelle. So outside of the ESP population and Listen. the applications they make some on me. Chronic absence. I don't think she know, means that for us. I'm okay. not sure. Um, so normally your local legal services, if it is a victim of trafficking, a sexual assault victim, particularly either of those, or an in person who is enrolled in a digi indigenous um, tribe, please just contact the coalition. We'll, we'll sort it out. If it's a domestic violence case, you should talk to your local um, legal services program. Okay. And another question to clarify, does VAWA not apply to all folks who are not receiving federal rental assistance? VAWA, parts of VAWA does do, but not this part of VAWA. VAWA requires state action, which means there has to be some sort of um, rental assistance. So there are other defenses if a private landlord seeking to evict someone based on their their um based on their victimization, but it is not VAWA 213. Again, I highly cannot stress enough, if it's a victim of trafficking or they've been sexual assault, sexually assaulted at any point, please call us because we do have experts on staff to assist. We, um, because of the number of domestic violence victims, we will, we will, you can certainly shoot me an email and I will try to get you the right person, um, but we do refer you to the normally the normal, local legal legal services or your CV lab attorney in your area. And just two more questions under this section. If a landlord denies an application for someone because they are previously a survivor of domestic violence, is, a way, is there a way for us to report that? Well, I don't know how we would report it. You can certainly um, let your local COC, if they're eligible for funding, the whoever's, if they're um, supportive housing or um, uh, permanent supportive housing or receiving rapid, you would definitely want to have a sit down with them and let the COC know in terms of funding, you, they should know that they're in violation of VAWA 213. If it's an individual client, again, that person may have a remedy and we'd welcome you to seek legal assistance with us or a legal services program. Okay, and last question. To show or prove that the bad credit is due to economic abuse, do you only have to put it in the letter you've mentioned or are there additional steps? I'm gonna ask you to hold that because we will okay. be getting to that one. Great, thank you. These are great questions and I appreciate you sticking with us despite the uh, challenges we've had this morning. So um, I'm gonna ask Kristen to talk a little bit about this if you're comfortable, Kristen. Um, we're gonna continue with VAWA 213. Amy, can I just have you go back to the previous slide real quick? Sure. There's a series of three documents that are developed by HUD. Um, the If you see their HUD form 5380, which is a notice of occupancy rights under the Violence Against Women Act, that is a really great document. Again, Google it. Um, you'll be able to get a copy of it. And that really kind of takes you step by step um, through what the rights are of someone who um, has been a survivor of any of those VAWA crimes. Um, just to give you a really quick overview, let me get to that page here I have in my notes. So Form 5380 is going to go over protections for applicants and protections for tenants, um, whether they're denied assistance, terminated from participation of a federal program, um, or evicted from their rental housing. Um, it's also going to talk about how you can remove the abuser or perpetrator from the household. It's going to talk about moving into another unit, otherwise known as an emergency transfer, which is actually the next slide. Um, it's going to talk about the sexual assault component um, and whether or not it occurred on the premise within 90 days from the time of the report. Um, it's going to talk about um, the needed documentation that we keep going um, back and forth on. So needed documentation. Something I wanted you guys to know on the previous bifurcation talk is that whether or not our survivor chooses to go back to their abuser is irrelevant in this conversation. It does not mean that just because they chose to go back to their abuser that they give up their VAWA rights. 
Um, so that's really, really important. And housing authorities and or landlords that are receiving the federal assistance that's covered under VAWA protections, um, they can request documentation. It's not required, um, but for most of them, they will request documentation. The survivor has to provide that documentation within 14 days of the time that the landlord requests it. And there are several different forms. HUD 5382 is a self-certification form for survivors to use that indicates that they have been uh, victimized and are a survivor of domestic violence. They could use any record of a federal, state, tribal, territorial, or local law enforcement agency, court, or administrative agency that documents the incident that happened to them. That could be a police report, it could be a protection order, it could be a restraining order, um, or they could use a signed statement um, by their survivor plus the signature of a victim service provider, an attorney, a mental health professional, and or their doctor to certify that they've been um, a victim of domestic violence. And that's in Form 5380. Additionally, it covers confidentiality that landlords and housing authorities have um, to keep this information private. And it also covers reasons a tenant um, might be eligible for uh, eviction that are not associated with VAWA rights. So that's something too to take a look at. Um, so we can just go to the next slide now. Well, I would uh, advocate, because I think Kristen did a good job of laying this out. Go, look at HUD 5380, read all of those sections. It, you really need to if um, you're doing this work at all. Um, it is important to be aware of what applies when and when and what, apply, what the spe specific um, parameters are. And it's laid out there pretty clearly. Um, and it's worth doing the time. Um, and I think it's important to recognize one of the things we didn't list with all the types of housing, and I saw there was a question, all the type of housing that's under um, VAWA 213. And it, the answer is a very lawyerly depends. <laughs> but it's pro most likely the there is going to be some argument to be made if there's if it's subsidized public or tax credit housing or ESG rapid or someone had a question about a voucher all of those would be under VAWA 213 if it's a private pay tenant to landlord it does not these protections don't apply there are others and they should seek their legal services a local legal services um, attorney but this does not apply to unless there is some form of federal funding involved. Um, and I think I want I want to make sure you heard that that sometimes survivors don't want to be in the space and they want an emergency transfer plan because it's unsafe. Someone who's been sexually assaulted in the house, someone whose perpetrator knows where they live. Um, may want to change, someone who's being stalked may want to change. And so this also provides for an emergency transfer plan. And it's very important um, that this is a, another remedy in addition to removing the perpetrator that is critical to know under VAWA 213 because I, I am still having this conversation with PHAs who should know this, that if there's, they have, that there should be they should have at this point an understanding that they must help and provide a transfer for someone who wants to in a public housing setting. Kristen? I think you covered it. Um, again, I would implore you to look up HUD 5381, which is actually the, the form that um, a survivor can um, complete requesting the emergency transfer along with the right documentation. It basically walks you through the steps. Um, and Sarah's, Sarah's definitely right. I, I can tell you from some of our own housing programs here at the agency, um, you know, survivor safety is paramount and we might be able to help them locate housing and get them in housing for with some type of rental assistance. Um, it might be a county away from where uh, they had their last interaction with their uh, abuser and that person might find them 
and it might prompt an immediate emergency transfer need. Um, the best thing to do in this situation is before you get the person into that housing, if you're a homeless advocate, um, is to definitely let your landlords know that um, using any of these federal subsidies to pay for rents does require them to comply with um, our protections. I wouldn't go and say, well, this person I'm working with is a domestic violence survivor because that's really not information for you to share with the landlord. Um, but if the landlord understands that in order to accept these rental subsidies that they have to comply with these VAWA protections, then it shouldn't be new news to them if, if something like this happens and you do need to um, hurry up and do an emergency transfer. And we've had several questions in the chat regarding vouchers, Kristen, um, whether the, if the perpetrator's in the home, but the victim has the voucher, or if it's a um, uh, subsidized housing with, you know, that's essentially voucher based, mm -hmm. there, it might be challenging. And those would be individual conversations that we would have to help you walk through. These, these are rights and responsibilities that are sort of generally applicable how it works specifically is going to turn a lot on the fact pattern. So we're not avoiding your question. We just know that there are very specific, it depends if that is the only um, voucher based uh, holding of that company for the one where the perpetrator refuses to leave. That's a little clearer in terms of her desire. She should buy, buy that would be an easier bifurcation of the lease. Um, but the landlord would also probably have to evict under the law, so there might be some safety concerns. These are not easy answers for individual cases, and we're happy to like to walk through some of those um, fact patterns with you individually, but we're kind of trying to make sure we get over the overview done. Um, so please know that we're not ignoring those questions. Um, So we just, we've already sort of covered that you can't, they, the housing programs and projects cannot make a survivor get a PPO. A survivor may invoke their VAWA protections and choose which form of VAWA documentation they would like to use. Next slide. This will continue. It's not a sunset. So we these protections are can continue. The HUD's final VAWA rule has been up and running since 2016. So that's long enough for us to start, um, for us as a housing movement to integrate, start begin to integrate that. And for those of you who are rural um, and maybe have ag housing, please know that those also, um, and I'm blanking on which ones are agriculture, if you know, Kristen, but I used to do a lot of those. Um, those also are housing, that's not just HUD. Those also must adhere to VAWA. Next slide. So here's a list, can, including but not limited to, which is something I always uh, lawyerly answer. I'm just going to read them because I think we've been talking about around this, um, but it's not just these, right? Public housing for sure. Um, Section 8 housing choice, project-based Section 8, which is some of what you were talking about with the voucher-based, um, project-based. Section 811, Section 202, Section 236, Section 221. Um, and a lot of those, the Section 221 can be uh, tax credit, low income, home, HOPWA, housing trust funds. This is a really important one, the next one, McKinney-Vento programs, which many of you don't think so, think of, but continuum of care-based programs and emergency shelter-based programs. So those of you who um, are operating a homeless shelter, this applies for folks who maybe have a perpetrator who's also in shelter. And rapid um, transitional permanent supportive, those are also things we don't often think about with VAWA 213. And that's really important because some of us administer those uh, rapid dollars, right? So we have a co-fiduciary duty with that landlord to make sure that we're applying the VAWA regulations. Kristen, do you have anything you want to add about those? 
Um, just a note. Um, so I think we have a lot of people on the call that do a lot of different things. Um, I know we have some housing authorities that are coming at it of what's our obligation. And then we might have some advocates in the field that are working with homeless individuals um, or just working with domestic violence survivors. And really, I think it's really important for you to know within the context of what your job is, um, how VAWA protections pertain. So for instance, if you're a a homeless advocate um, working with someone that you've identified as a domestic violence survivor and you you know that because let's say your local HARA had indicated that they had domestic violence that they were fleeing or let's say you've had you know lots and lots of conversation and some of these things have come out and maybe they're not as they come into coordinate coordinated entry identified as domestic violence but you have come to know this about them then it really should be your responsibility to make sure that they know what their rights are and that the landlords that you're working with also know what their obligations are if they want to collect those rental subsidies. On the flip side, as a housing authority or a landlord, um, it's not about how can we uh, how can we get around serving domestic violence survivors because they might disrupt the peace and livability of other people living in your development. It's about how can we connect these individuals to the resources that they need so that they're protected and we can do a really good job at making sure that they're safe. So that's what I ha would have to add to that, Sarah. Absolutely. It's important that we want, this was passed so that we could better help victims of violence Domestic violence is the, and, and sexual assault are the leading cause of homelessness for women. Um, families become homeless and we want folks to become and stay safe. So this is about not finding the narrowest interpretation, but figuring out how a rising tide lifts, lifts all boats so that all folks can be helped um, and all populations get the service that they need. And if I may interject uh, a question from Amanda, do VAWA protections apply if a person feels unsafe in their housing due to violence within the surrounding community, even if they've not experienced violence or the threat of violence against them directly? No, it is definitely around um, violence directly to them, sexual assault or stalking or family violence. So if, you know, there's a um, adult child in the home and you help with seniors, you help seniors and they're being, um, threatened or stalked or sexually assaulted. It doesn't have to be intimate partner, but it definitely has to be um, violence, uh, living together violence. And the last question um, from Renee, what types of rental assistance or funding might someone qualify for if they are a survivor? You may have mentioned it, Kristen, but she just wanted you to revisit that if you would. Sure, so if a person is staying in a domestic violence shelter, they're considered literally homeless. Um, and they are uh, eligible for whatever programs that they might qualify for. Some of those programs that we have throughout the state are gonna be rapid rehousing programs or permanent supportive housing programs. There might be some transitional supportive housing programs, it depends on what you have in your area. Um, there also might be some project-based developments that they could live in or um, some housing choice vouchers. There's a lot of different uh, rental subsidies that can be found um, provided that they're available in the area, that the wait lists aren't too long. It really depends on where you're located within the state to see how quickly um, they could move into something. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? And I would add for Shannon's question, um in terms of the domestic violence, um, fleeing domestic violence, that's an individual interpretation based on, for those of you who are working in shelter, what fleeing means is dependent on your program. So in your situation, some shelters would have considered that person fleeing. And certainly um, in many cases, she would be about eligible for, um, more housing-based assistance, um, since it certainly makes sense to keep folks in their home than um, force them into shelter to ass get assistance. So again, it's one of those case-by-case -case situations, but we do recognize that some of this is hard based on the dearth of funding, right? And the 
absolute housing crisis. And I think we're all working on that and trying to figure out the best solutions within the law and for the for all of the how, folks we're helping who are homeless. So I think we wanna talk about misconceptions. Um, we talked a lot about this, but please remember, this is not just domestic violence, not that domestic violence isn't, domestic violence is the leading cause of, um, is the leading cause of, is the lead, femicide is the leading murder for women, which essentially means an intimate partner is more likely to murder you than anyone else. Um, it's very, very much a serious matter. Um, sex, so with sexual assault, and that's any sexual assault, the landlord, um, intimate partner, stranger sexual assault, um, and stalking, and dating violence. These are all VAWA crimes. And think more broadly, if I want, if you want to take a few things away from this, think about um, how broad some of these protections are and how broadly the VAWA crimes are meant to be, so that we're not just saying it's domestic violence. Again, survivors have as many reasons as rec for reconciling with their abuser as they as we have people in our society it's not relevant what's relevant is what they're seeking for so you, a landlord might say to you but she go she's gone back four times that's standard in domestic violence that's not abnormal and it's irrelevant and no one should be asking that question instead of why did she stay we ask why does he abuse um it, these are requirements just because you're unfamiliar with them it's not an acceptable excuse under the law VAWA protections are not limited to women they're for victims of violence and that includes men that includes folks in lgbtq relationships that includes folks who are non-binary and they're violent protections for all ages so some folks um may occur against youth uh, who are living in an assisted household. The family may need to exercise vow protection to protect the youth. That includes stalking. I can think of sexual assault matters where someone might need an emergency transfer because one of the um, youths in the household was sexually assaulted or is being stalked by someone in the um, public housing complex. Go ahead and move forward. So this is where I really want... Um, folks to know, applicants cannot be denied housing based on factors directly related to victimization, like job history, credit history, or criminal record. So credit history is a big one. Perpetrators often take out credit cards in their victims' names. Um, same with job history. Perpetrators often um, destabilize a victim's uh, employment. Folks ask me what you would do for proof. I would definitely, while I don't know that it's legally required, I would definitely lay out how the victimization is directly affecting these matters. For example, if someone was beaten up and forced to um, uh, be a drug mule, that would be something that needs to be in the letter to explain how it was directly related to that she was coerced into that crime. Kristen, do you have anything you want to add on that? Whoops, I'm on mute. Um, I think I'm going to save what I had to add when we get to later on in the presentation. Excellent. Oh, keep go, um, go back. We're not done yet, Amy. <laughs> so it's really important um, that you remember that domestic violence is a pattern of power and control, and the perpetrators often trying to destabilize the job history, the credit history, to get the victim arrested so that she will not be able to become and stay safe, that she'll be dependent on him. And it's important that societally we don't um, reward that abusive behavior by excluding that survivor and his or her children forced from adequate housing. So it also um, requires confidentiality. So at some, you, you ha cannot disclose the information to any other in, um, entity uh, or um, it's for use in an eviction or otherwise required by law. 
that's a whole separate training that we have on confidentiality. So I'd be happy to answer questions on that. And I see we've got some questions um, piling up, but let me finish this. Um, so many adverse factors may seem like they're not related to the DV, um, particularly things like credit history or job history may seem not completely unrelated, but they are often a result of victimization. The adverse defense may be present during an abusive relationship. So it might be during the relationship he did these things or the perpetrator may be destabilizing economics and um, economics and job at the time the victim is attempting to flee. I think it's really important. I cannot tell you, I've helped hundreds of survivors over the last 20 years. Every single one, almost every single one had an element of economic abuse and that bears out nationally. 94% of victims say that the perpetrator has kept income earning abilities away from them and or destabilized a job or credit. So it looks like we have some questions. Uh, one was just a request to put on a t-shirt the quote you mentioned, instead of why did she stay, we should ask why did he abuse? <laughs> Excellent um, fundraising opportunity. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Anita, what if the victim was fortunate to have a relative or friend provide them a safe place, but just for a limited time, how would they apply for housing? Domestic violence. Oh, go ahead, Kristen. Are you sure? Say, yeah, I think you're going to say what I'm going to say. It's cool. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to flip back to the Hearth Act of 2009, and that um, expanded. HUD's definition of homelessness. Um, and so when someone is fleeing domestic violence and they're couch surfing, as we call it, at a friend's house or a family member's house, it's time limited. It's not a permanent place that they're staying. Um, and unlike other um, folks that are experiencing homelessness, couch surfing actually qualifies under category four for HUD's definition of homelessness. And so they would need to go through their coordinated entry uh, program in their service area, which is otherwise known as the HARA or Housing Assessment Resource Agency. Um, they would have to do the intake and they would have to tell the person that's doing the intake that they are fleeing domestic violence. And then they would qualify for services under category four for HUD. Um, and then they would become eligible for whatever uh, rental assistance programs are available in that area. Sarah, did you have something to add? That's exactly what I was gonna say. And I will say it's another takeaway because many folks within housing don't know that piece of the hearth act that normally couch surfing is not homelessness, but domestic, for domestic violence survivors, it is. And that's a really important piece of information as we move forward in advocacy for survivors of violence. And Amy, if I can, I will try to attach um, a brief from the National, National Network to End Domestic Violence. They have a really nice brief on um, the category four for HUD so that everyone can see the paper. Okay. And after the course, since we had so many technical difficulties, um, I have the Q and A's and I will, we don't normally do this, but email people the slides, the presentation and, and combine all that um, to follow up with you just because it was a little challenging in the beginning. So whatever you would like to send me, I can include in that correspondence. I've taken notes as we've gone on the HUD 5380 and things like that. Um, may I do a few more questions at this point, just so we don't get too far behind? Absolutely. Okay. Um, yes, on the slides, I will absolutely include that um, from James. For lack of a better of term, better term, fraud as a form of abuse. Does the victim have to be doing anything for that protection? Domestic violence is domestic violence, and so they would it would fall it would fall under the same categories as um, domestic and violence as a pattern of power and control. Thank you. And I think we are all caught up. Thank awesome. you for taking those. And I know we're running out of time, but we want to keep going and hopefully we can go just a few minutes over because we started a little bit late. So considerations, 
let's talk about failure to pay rent, victim's injury or temporary incapacitation based on an injury. The arrest of the only wage earning member of the household for domestic violence is directly related to their victimization. Often domestic violence cases, the perpetrator will prevent the victim from obtaining or maintaining employment. If they're undocumented or underdocumented, they will prevent documentation or ability to get a work visa. Sabotaging work and employment opportunities by stalking, harassing the victim. I had a client whose perpetrator every day would uh, let the air out of her tires so that she'd be late. And every day she had to fix her tires. Um, that is a standard tactic by perpetrators causing the victim to lose their job by physically battering prior to important meetings or interviews, or forcing the victim to work without pay in a family business. Next slide. Other ones, poor credit history, because I know this is a big one. Forcing a victim to obtain credit, including credit cards in the perpetrator's name for his use or her use, using the victim's credit or debit card without permission. Selling a victim's personally identifiable information to identify thieves, thieves, identity thieves, running up debt, obtaining loans and mortgages in the victim's names, often also putting uh, the electrical and heat in the victim's or the child's name, preventing a victim from obtaining or maintaining employment, sabotaging work, um, forcing a victim to work without pay, job loss, um, or hospitalization or medical bills. Next slide. I think we're at questions. More poor rental history. Often a perpetrator will damage the um, the rental unit. There'll be noise complaints, there'll be harassment, trespassing, threats. I can't tell you how many cases I've had where the perpetrator, she has, the victim has a new place and the perpetrator is call, um, keeps breaking the door down and the landlord wants to evict her because the police keep getting called drug deals. And I think that was a great example by Kristen where the drug deal by the abuser got the victim who held the property in her own name. Um, there was an attempt at eviction. Mr. Late utility payments, bad checks to the landlord, early lease termination or short lease terms. Let's go to the next one. We'll get to the questions at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, forcing a victim to write bad checks. These are just examples of things we've all seen. Property damage, disorderly conduct. Unfortunately, when you call the police, they don't always um, know who to arrest. And sometimes victims do get arrested what? in our world. Um, 911 abuse, drunkenness, drug activity, failure to protect a child from batter's violence, and human trafficking, all of which are... Um, considerations for criminal history. So now the idea is this last period, and we'd hope to have a few more minutes, but I'm hoping that we'll, you'll all stay if you have questions, is that we wanna bring this together. We want you to ask us questions around things you've seen, knowing now what you've seen, what you've seen in our presentation, the idea is Knowing that all of these victimizations are part of VAWA 213 and these um, things that may not seem related, but often are, think about how this might change your advocacy and um, let us know if we can answer any questions for you. And we'll make sure that Amy gets our contact information out as well. Obviously, we got started a little late, so I'm happy to stay as well. A couple of the questions that came in, what documentation can you show to be able to approve an applicant when a survivor is being denied due to credit barriers, for example, when those barriers can be linked to their domestic violence situation? I'm going to let Kristen answer this one. It depends on what the situation is. Um, for instance, if you had someone who, think about it this way, your significant other, your partner, you know their birth, their date of birth, right? You know what their mother's maiden name was or is. You probably know their social security number or if you don't, you have it written down somewhere. You know all their, their real secret personally identifying information. And so 
it's so easy to take that information and use it against a survivor or victim um, in opening a credit card or getting into their bank account to see, you know, where they've spent money or taking money from them. And so if you can use some of that information, like th those are, those are criminal offenses. So if you, if the police were involved, there would be a police report on it that this person, um, you know, uh, identity theft or whatever the case might be that they could use in order to show the landlord that, um, you know, the reason why their credit history or, uh, you know, they have these issues is re directly related to their victimization. Um, I think it's important, like, for instance, to like, if, if a utility bill was put in their name, um, or their child's name. I think that would be a really provable thing as well. Um, they lived in the home. There's been incidences of domestic violence because there's police reports. The person had a personal protection order that you could kind of, kind of line all of these things up. Again, the landlord or housing authority would have to kind of use their discretion on it. And I don't think there's any hard and fast rule on it. Um, but I think if you had collected the evidence with the survivor, and you advocate for them and, and try to help the, the landlord or housing authority um, understand the context of the situation, then they might look at it differently. I hope that answer, answers your question. Thank you. Um, another question from Emily from Housing Help of uh, Lenaway. Do private landlords have to also follow VAWA laws if they aren't getting funding or something else along that nature? No, unfortunately, VAWA 213 does not apply to private landlords unless they're receiving federal dollars. There are other defenses. And again, I would recommend um, out in Lenaway, you have a great legal services program. Contact um, the legal services program in your area. I know there's one in Monroe and one in Ann Arbor because um, I used to live over there. So um, I'd recommend you contact them. And then I see, a, can I help a client get a VAWA if her if her if it uh, was a family member yes if it's a family member who resides with her is that correct Kristen essentially it has to be um someone sharing the same residence yes it can be a spouse it can be a parent it can be a child um it could be a guardian that lives in the same household I know there was a question a little bit earlier about whether or not VAWA protections apply to persons who feel unsafe in their housing due to violence in the surrounding community and that does not apply. Um, remember it this way it has to be committed against the person living in the actual apartment. Anybody else. You all have stuck with me. Um, through our tech challenges. Does anyone want to unmute or ask any additional questions? I'm going to give it just about 30 more seconds. Um, and I would ask, uh, I'm going to put my contact information in the answers, I think. So I think that's how we do that. Yes. Um, and when I send the follow-up email out with the slides and the recording, I'll be sure with your permission to put that in the email to the participants as well. Absolutely. Um, because I certainly, a lot of this, um, I would like to make sure um, that folks have my, a lot of this is very situational dependent and we are here to assist. And I really um, encourage folks who, again, who have folks who are stalking, sexual assault um, or human trafficking or as an indigenous um, survivor, consider sending um, a fact pattern to your second. We ask you not to give us our email out to clients yet because mm -hmm. reasons. Um, but if you send your email, your your client case to slc at mcdsv.org, um, that's anything but domestic violence, We will, especially if it's a housing matter, um, particularly if you're in the metro area, but even if you're across the um, state, please send your a uh, fact pattern, we'll be able to see if it's something we can legally assist you with as well.